Welcome to my full long COVID recovery guide. I'm gonna give you everything you need in this video to make a full recovery from long COVID. We're gonna unpick four mechanisms of action of how long COVID causes the symptoms that it causes. And I'm gonna present you with solutions so that you can fix them so you don't have to live with long COVID anymore. So before I get into these mechanisms of action, I think I should tell you a little bit about me, why I'm recording this video and my experience with long COVID. And actually my story goes back a little bit further than just long COVID. Several years back, I actually developed chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm going to show you some, some pictures here and you may be a little shocked or maybe not. Maybe you're in a similar position and if you are, I am so sorry. So this is what my life was. You know, you can see me laying on the floor here, um, completely disabled. I was on disability benefits at this time. I was bedridden. I was also blinded. I would basically leave my, leave my bed for 30 minutes a day just basically to do things to stay alive. So to eat food, to use the washroom, things like that. My life was basically just a living hell. The highlight of my social life was uh, visiting the hospital in a, in a stretcher. You know, I had to get the non-emergency patient transport with chronic fatigue syndrome. You do not have a single drop of energy. And the reason that I'm, that I'm sharing this today in this video is there's a very strong parallel. There is a very strong connection between chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID. And my experiences with chronic fatigue syndrome are actually very helpful, very useful in resolving long COVID. But I also did develop long COVID at some point too. And that's something that I've been working through. So I can present you with some solutions for this as well. So what are the symptoms of long COVID? Well, don't take it from me. I've scoured the NHS website. So this is the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. And these are the most common symptoms. The most common and defining symptom of long COVID is chronic fatigue, is, is basically just never being able to have enough energy, constantly being in an energy deficit, in an energy debt. This is the most common and I would say most important symptom as it gives us several clues as to the mechanisms of action as to how long COVID causes the symptoms that it does. In here, we also have several other symptoms like shortness of breath, like brain fog, heart palpitations, joint and muscle aches. Now, I found a very cool study here that I just wanna share with you very quickly that shows a very strong connection between long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome. I will read from the article here. The illness, long COVID, is similar to myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome, ME slash CFS, as well as to persisting illnesses that can follow a wide variety of other infectious agents and following major traumatic injury. Most important to note here are the connections of these symptoms. Reading from the article again, abnormalities of the central and autonomic nervous system, lungs, heart, vasculature, immune system, gut microbiome, energy metabolism, and redox balance. You may already be seeing a parallel with the symptom sets, but as we go further into this video, you're gonna understand that both of these illnesses have similarities in the mechanisms of action of causing these symptoms. Finally, before we move on to the mechanisms of action, I just wanna show you this one last study connecting long COVID and CFS again. As you'll see here, it says, Interestingly, some potentially beneficial genera, such as bifidobacteria, and this is the one I want to want you to focus on, bifidobacteria, display a notable decrease in CFS patients compared to healthy controls. So we're going to come back to this. We're going to look more at the microbiome as the fourth mechanism of action. So we're going to come back and we're going to look at this in more detail. But I just want you to have this in the back of your mind. So I have categorized the four mechanisms of action as to how COVID causes the dysfunction and the symptoms in the body that it does as the four Ds. These are mitochondrial dysfunction, antioxidant depletion, microbiome disruption, also known as COVID gut, and immune dysregulation. In just a moment, we're gonna take a deep dive into each of these four topics. But before we do so, we need to figure out how is it that COVID is causing these dysfunction? And this comes down to two things primarily that we need to look at. The first being the spike protein, the second being the effect of chronic viral infections on the body. So the spike protein is a protein that is produced by the coronavirus. This is also what the vaccine manufacturers attempted to mimic in COVID vaccines to stimulate the body into creating an immune response to protect you from COVID and COVID symptoms. The big problem that we have here, however, is that the spike protein is a prion. It is a misfolded protein which behaves as a reactive oxygen species inside the body, creating inflammation. In this study here, we can see it says, SARS-CoV-2 infection and the pathogenesis of prion diseases. Specifically, SARS-CoV-2 contributes to the long-term pathological outcome of prion disease. It continues to say, SARS-CoV-2 targets mitochondria and promotes their dysfunction. SARS-CoV-2 mediated overproduction of reactive oxygen species can lead to the misfolding of prion proteins that can then propagate in this environment. So you can see here, we're already building the case for the fact that 
this is damaging the mitochondria and causing mitochondrial dysfunction, but this is also creating an excessive amount of reactive oxygen species inside the body, and this will deplete the antioxidant status of the body. This is actually one of the common denominators in chronic fatigue syndrome, that almost all chronic fatigue syndrome patients have depleted their antioxidant stores. You can check their glutathione levels and they are all depleted, they are all low. I'm also aware there is a lot of controversy around COVID vaccines, and I don't want to particularly get into that today, so I'm not going to share my personal opinion. However, I will read you this line from this study. CD16 plus monocytes can continually produce spike protein for months after vaccination, possibly through prolonged cytosolic presence of mRNA or reverse transcription of the mRNA into DNA. What this means is the COVID vaccine turns the body into a spike protein producing factory. Now, studies are great. They give us something to look at some hard science, but what does this actually mean? What this means is coronavirus inside your body. If your body is unable to beat the acute infection of coronavirus, it can take up residence inside of your body. And as it does so, it will continue to produce these spike proteins. Even if your body is able to get on top of this acute infection, but you receive a COVID vaccination, your body will be continually producing these spike proteins. The reason this is so bad is spike proteins are basically reactive oxygen species. So if you don't know what that is, it's basically the opposite of an antioxidant. This means it is a molecule that will move around inside of your body and will create inflammation. It will destroy cells. It will deplete nutrients. It's basically just a persistent drain on your body's life force energy and its attempts to heal and fix itself. Again, another parallel between long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome is chronic viral infections. It's very common for people with chronic fatigue syndrome to have Epstein-Barr virus or even things like Lyme disease or other types of chronic pathogenic infections where the body's immune system is simply unable to remove these organisms from the body or in the case of viruses, to keep them in remission as viruses are never actually alive. If the body is unable to keep the coronavirus in check. It will live in the gut. It will live in other mucosal areas of the body. This looks like the lungs, and this is why there can be some lung symptoms, shortness of breath. And they will live in these environments, continually stealing the host's resources and energy and producing these toxic spike proteins that deplete the antioxidant status, dysregulate the immune system, create inflammatory cascades, and disrupt the gut microbiome. Now, let's change gears and actually go into these mechanisms of action a little bit more, because if we can define these mechanisms of action, if you can understand how spike protein and the coronavirus are causing these symptoms, we can figure out how we can support the body to not have these symptoms anymore. I truly believe that symptoms are simply an indicator of a job that the body is unable to for some reason. Something is preventing it from healing. Something is preventing it from functioning the way that it wants to. And if we can understand what is causing that dysfunction and correct it, the symptoms will disappear. I can say this with authority and with confidence because I deeply understood the mechanism of my chronic fatigue syndrome and I fixed it. I don't have chronic fatigue syndrome anymore. I've also experienced symptoms of long COVID after a COVID infection and they are significantly reduced. We're talking 95% gone. Let's fire through these mechanisms of action. I'm going to provide you a little bit of evidence for each, and then we're going to find a solution to these problems. This study here outlined SARS-CoV-2 proteins are known to selectively target organelle components such as the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. That is the key here, the mitochondria. And they can reside in the host mitochondrial matrix. This results in mitochondrial dysfunction. So there we go. That's the first point, mitochondrial dysfunction, and increases oxidative stress. This oxidative stress depletes the antioxidants and feeds immune dysregulation. Regulation. Ultimately, this leads to the loss of mitochondrial integrity and causes cell death. Now, if we know the mitochondria are what producing your energy, if you have the SARS-CoV-2 proteins destroying your mitochondria, you're going to be in an energy deficit, you're going to be experiencing brain fog. So we need to do something to help the mitochondria. We need to protect them and we need to encourage them to grow and to proliferate and to build them back stronger. This study I found absolutely unbelievable. These numbers, these statistics are crazy. Check this out. We found a 42.63% higher likelihood of acquiring autoimmunity for patients who have suffered from COVID-19. This estimate was similar for common autoimmune diseases such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Sjogren's syndrome. Can you see how this is super connected to your immune function and your immune dysregulation? I guarantee you, if your body was able to have COVID and completely clear this infection, it would not develop autoimmunity. The fact that autoimmune conditions are developing means that they 
there's some weird stuff going on in the immune system. It's losing its strength. It's unable to completely defeat these infections and it's causing some level of immune dysfunction. When the immune system becomes dysregulated like this, not only do we develop autoimmune diseases as listed in here and all of the others, this can include Crohn's and colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, this can be any autoimmune condition. It doesn't just have to be these three, but we lose strength in our immune system. If the immune system is busy attacking our own cells, not only is it wasting energy from the food that we've eaten and from the immune cells that it's produced, but the energy and resources that were supposed to be fueling our strong immune response are now being depleted and our immune system becomes weaker, which again is one of these parallels between long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, maybe I've saved the best mechanism of action to last. Maybe, maybe not. I love God health. I'm super nerdy about it. I really, really, I love it just because there's so many results to be found there. So here we go. The studies show that COVID-19 is associated with changes in the gut and nasal microbiome, including the decrease in abundance of bifidobacterium. The presence of bifidobacterium was associated with a reduced risk of severe COVID-19. So first of all, can you see the parallel between the study that I showed you earlier and this study about chronic fatigue syndrome and the decreased abundance of bifidobacterium? Something also worth noticing here is is those that had a strong bifidobacterium presence in their gut were actually more protected against COVID-19 in the first place. But taking that one step further, this is a pattern that I have seen in many of my clients. The depletion of the healthy bacteria in the gut, the probiotics in the gut, but in particular, the bifidobacterium. This makes you think that supporting your microbiome and bringing bifidobacterium back into the gut is gonna be an intrinsic part of this recovery process and you're right. This is why I really like looking at health problems, diseases, and symptoms through this sort of lens. Because if you can really, truly, intrinsically understand where the dysfunction is, the solutions begin to present themselves almost obviously. Let me present you with some solutions. And these aren't just ideas, I also have studies to back these up. So the first one here, we're looking at autophagy and how this can help us in recovery. Here you can see this study outlines that targets are usually damaged organelles, misfolded proteins, or aggregates. This tells us that if we can boost autophagy, not only can we target damaged organelles, so this is this is mitochondria that have been damaged, but we can also directly attack misfolded proteins, which is exactly what the spike protein is. This tells us that autophagy is going to be one of the key players in resolving this situation. If you have any guesses about how we're going to boost autophagy, leave me a comment below. Let me know what your guesses are. I'll be really interested to see. I'm going to give you five seconds to guess and then I'm gonna reveal how we're gonna be boosting autophagy today. So one of the best ways that we can boost autophagy is fasting. If we're fasting with autophagy in mind, longer term fasting is actually more beneficial. You will get small improvements in autophagy from things like intermittent fasting, where you're eating in a six hour eating window and then fasting for 18. But really to get into autophagy, we need to use a longer term fasting. The reason for this is if you look in the rodent models, you'll see that autophagy really takes off between 24 and 48 hours. Thing is, mice are significantly smaller than we are. And and what happens in a mouse happens about 10 times faster than happens in a human. Thing is, fasting can be really stressful for the body as well. So if you're already dealing with chronic fatigue, adrenal fatigue, just generally struggling to stay alive, depriving the body of food and forcing it to do this very deep cleaning autophagy process can be kind of tough. So what I would suggest would be a maximum of a three day fast. However, I wouldn't start there. I would build up very slowly. I would consider starting with three 24 hour fasts, then trying two 48 hour fasts and if all is going well then consider doing one 72 hour fast i do just want to emphasize that if fasting is not for you right now do what you can for a very long time i could not fast it would cause me horrendous symptoms it was un bearable. I would have pain in my neck and in my shoulders. I would have a raging headache. My kidneys and my colon would ache. I would have aches all over my body. I would get flare-ups of my histamine symptoms. It would throw me into anxiety and depression. I would have heart palpitations. I'm not saying just throw yourself in at the deep end. That's also not how healing works, but do what you can. I had one client that was very intolerant to fasting, same as myself, and we, we fasted her to figure out what her optimal fasting window was. And it turns out that she could manage about a 21 hour fast and then she would begin to have symptoms she would begin to have problems so we set the goal as a 20 hour fast one time per week and that's working wonderfully you can continue to push this window if you're able or if you're in a place where you can do more extended fasting and 
you can handle that, your body is strong enough to handle that, I would say that the maximum benefits can be reached at around the three day mark, 72 hours. I do wanna say that fasting is something that you should do under the guidance of a professional if you're not sure what you're doing. I do find it funny when people say, if you're gonna fast, you should contact a medical professional because the thing is, we've been fasting for millennia. It's a, an intrinsic part of the function of the body. The thing is, if you do it wrong, you can cause yourself more problems than you solve. So fasting is a fantastic way to boost autophagy. There's also several, there's dozens of other benefits to fasting, but just looking at it through the lens of long COVID, the autophagy component is amazing. Next, we have another study here. It says, other factors which influence autophagy are acute heat exposure, as one would experience in a sauna, flavonoid consumption, phenolic compounds, and coffee. So this gives us a few things. The main one that I was trying to focus on here was the heat exposure. Sauna is a really good way to do this, but it doesn't have to be a sauna. This can be a hot bath. This can be anything that increases your body temperature. This can even be sunbathing if you're living in a nice climate. It is also worth noting on the other things in this text though, flavonoid consumption, phenolic compounds, and coffee. When we're thinking about things, we're thinking about different smells, tastes, colors in different foods. So think about that aroma of coffee. Think about the richness of chocolate. Think about the flavor of onion and garlic. All of these foods have different phenolic compounds, different flavonoid compositions, and all of these things not only boost autophagy. They also boost detoxification. They also feed your microbiome, which we're going to come to very soon. And finally here, I also just wanted to show you this last study that helps us understand how the heat therapies like sauna and hot baths can help us with dealing with these prions. So this study says, our results indicated that pharmacological induction of the heat shock response in cells chronically infected with prions significantly decreased prion accumulation. What this means is heat shock proteins are a form of protein the body produces in response response to acute heat exposures like saunas, hot baths. What these proteins do, according to this study, is they help to decrease the prion accumulation inside the cells. Spike proteins, also known as prions, have been connected to a whole bunch of different disorders, especially neurodegenerative disorders, including things like Alzheimer's and dementia. When the cells accumulate the spike proteins, the prions, they create masses of inflammation and they cause severe dysfunction, even as far down as a mitochondrial level. So with these heat exposures, not only do we boost autophagy, we also induce the production of these heat shock proteins, which break these prions down and help the body remove them. Now, the final piece of this puzzle is working on the COVID gut, working on this disruption of the microbiome. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. I'm sure you've probably already come to this conclusion, but if long COVID is causing a disruption in the microbiome by killing the bifidobacterium and lowering their numbers, taking a bifidobacterium supplement seems like a logical first step. If you're not sure, if you have low bifidobacterium, it will look something like this in your stool tests. The first of these tests is showing you a below detectable limit of bifidobacterium in the stool that was collected. And the second test shows you a no growth level of bifidobacterium in a stool culture. Either of these could be really good indicators that you've got bifidobacterium disruption in your gut. So how do we fix it? Well, as I see it, you've got three options. This is my favorite brand of probiotics because they are the most powerful. They are the best value for money and they don't have any filler or binders or excipients or anything. They're just pure probiotics and they're in a powder form, which means you can customize your dose perfectly. I am not affiliated with this company. However, if I could be, I guarantee you I would be. I would love to make a little bit of money sharing these probiotics with you because they are honestly wonderful. So you have three options. We could start with the five strain bifidobacterium. We could start with the bifidobacterium longum single strain, or we could look at the delactate free probiotic powder. I'm going to help you figure out how to decide. If you look at your stool test and your lactobacillus levels look good. You've got good lactobacillus and you've got good lactobacillus growth. Go with the five strain bifidobacteria. If you are extremely sensitive, you know, we're talking bed bound. If you are extremely intolerant to foods, you know, if you're on a really restrictive diet of like 10 or less foods, or you're on a carnivore diet, if you're extremely reactive to probiotics, start with a single strain formula. You would be looking at trying the bifidobacterium longum as the best one to start with, because this creates a really nice foundation for other organisms to move in. And finally, we've got the delactate free probiotic powder. 
This was actually the one that I started with personally. This is um, this is fantastic if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, especially if you're experiencing D-lactate intolerance. This is also something that is caused by uh, gut dysbiosis, and this is most easily characterized by very poor post-exercise recovery. So an acidic feeling in the in the muscles, as in if you were to even do a very small amount of exercise, you would have muscle soreness as if you have run a marathon or if you've run up a very steep hill. I can remember for me, this looked like simply washing a couple of dishes, the effort of standing over the sink, my calves would become rocks. They would cramp up and they would ache for three or four days after just doing that small level of effort. Now, I would recommend starting on a very small dose of these things. I actually have another video called the Goldilocks Zone, which helps you figure out how to dose your probiotics. It's a very nuanced art. And if you take too much, you are going to feel terrible. You really have to make sure that you're working within your Goldilocks zone. As in, if you've heard the childhood tale, Goldilocks, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. So we don't need to take too much. We don't want to take too little. We want to take just the right dose. I will link the Goldilocks zone video somewhere around my face, somewhere. So if you need help with dosing your probiotics, make sure you go and check that video out. Finally, we can look at a prebiotic. So a prebiotic is a food that feeds the probiotics. The best prebiotic that we can use to feed bifidobacterium is something called HMO. This is an acronym for human milk oligosaccharide. This is a type of prebiotic that was discovered in human breast milk. And the reason that this is a really nice probiotic for bifidobacterium specifically is that this prebiotic is very selective in the fact that it feeds bifidobacterium. If you think about a child that is in those initial stages of gut colonization, it's received the, the bifidobacteria and the other flora from the mother's vagina at birth. It is then fed these HMOs that are in the breast milk. And that is what causes these organisms to colonize. So combining a probiotic with a prebiotic is very nice. What I would say is build up to somewhat of a therapeutic dose of just the probiotic first and then layer the prebiotic in afterwards. Because although HMOs do preferentially feed bifidobacterium, they can feed other organisms too. So make sure that we've built some of a bifidobacterium presence in the gut first. So that fairly much wraps up today's video. I hope you have a really solid idea now of how to tackle long COVID. If you need any help with this, reach out. I offer one-to-one -one consultations. I have experience with this firsthand. Having experienced and recovered from such a severe debilitating chronic health condition, I have a perspective and an understanding on this situation that is extremely rare. Very few practitioners can relate to what you are experiencing on such a personal level as I can. I do hope that this video has given you everything that you need to get started, but if you do need a little bit of extra help, please do reach out. That's everything for me today. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.